In recent years, the issue of mass incarceration had reached the United States popular conscious. From black artists speaking out at the Academy Awards. There are more black men under correctional control today than were under slavery in 1850. To Netflix documentaries such as 13th. After the Civil War, African Americans were arrested in mass. It was our nation's first prison boom. And even in recent presidential debates. I want to bring the conversation back to the broken criminal justice system that is disproportionately negatively impacting black and brown people all across this country today. And yet the issue has not been sufficiently addressed in any manner as 2.3 million people still remain incarcerated in the United States of America. A recent study by the Justice Policy Institute shows that Maryland incarcerates more black male adults than any other state in the United States. I guess at this point, you know, we know that things are out of control. The issue becomes more stark when we realize that most of the people incarcerated in Maryland comes from Baltimore City. I spoke about this at a life sentencing conference in 2017. In the urban communities, the citizens are locked up. In the rural communities, the citizens are locking those urban citizens up. And so you create a situation where you have jobs for one community, incarceration, or I call it imprisonment for another community. Yet Merlin officials have a different view of what's going on. In a past debate between Governor Hogan and Ben Jealous, who was running for government, Hogan stated that Merlin's incarceration rate and prison conditions had been reformed and was improving. We've reduced our prison population more than the other 49 states. We're number one in America in reducing the prison population. In lieu of the progressive image that Maryland Governor Hogan was presenting, former Maryland prison guard and executive director of the Justice Policy Institute, Mark Schindler, thought it was important to release this report. Um, there's been some progress in Maryland, a little bit. Uh, there's been declines in the prison population in recent years, and I think we should all applaud that. Uh, but they haven't gone anywhere near far enough. And so uh, we thought it was time uh, to do a couple of things. One, to remind folks uh, of uh, the significant issues within Maryland's justice system, or as some, I think, would fairly call, call it, the injustice system in Maryland. Uh, including the, the, the deep and stark racial disparities that we're seeing overall. The report reveals that Maryland is number one in locking up black males from 18 to 24 and keeping them locked up and breaking up families for decades. A significant majority of the people who are serving long sentences mm -hmm. in Maryland's prisons went in before they were age 25. Yes, yes. They went in when they were young adults. We didn't do good things or productive things when they were younger, and now they're still sitting in Maryland's prison, prisons um, as, as older individuals. So it's like the same population at two different points in time. We wanted to lift up that discussion and really draw attention again to the, the really alarming racial disparities in Maryland's justice system and, and really have people hopefully start to do something about it. Schindler talks about how black communities are disproportionately affected by social abandonment by the state in Maryland and nationwide. I sat down with Schindler to talk about the report on black mass incarceration in Maryland before the pandemic hit in 2020. It's a larger issue uh, within our society, including what we see in Maryland, right? So if you looked at Maryland's child welfare system, you would see disparate treatment of kids of color. Mm -hmm. If you looked at Maryland's uh, schools, right, you would see a higher percentage of uh, black and Latino kids being suspended and expelled mm -hmm. from school. If you looked at housing, right, if you looked at employment. When I first heard about this report, 
Louisiana came to mind. It popped in my head, and I'm saying Angola is like the largest prison yeah. system in the United States. Um, I thought of Texas, I thought of Mississippi, and um, what's the calculus you use to determine that Maryland yeah. is the the most corporate of incarceration yeah. states? Maryland um, leads the nation in a way that we shouldn't be proud of at all. So more than twice the national average in terms of people, the proportion of people in its prison uh, system that are black, and more than those other states you ticked off, Mississippi, Georgia, Louisiana, South Carolina. We can't just recognize it. What are we going to do about it? After slavery ended in 65, whatever, uh, prison systems sprung up all over right. the South and obviously um, here in Maryland also. Is this, I mean, does the Institute see this as a continuation of slavery? Clearly, the, you know, the, the original sin in this country mm -hmm. of slavery hasn't fully gone away, and we're still seeing the repercussions. And in some ways, most um, uh, explicitly, we see that in our justice system. The, mm -hmm. the other thing I think we have to remind ourselves mm -hmm. uh, when we think about Maryland and we talk about the, the, those other southern states is Maryland is a southern state. Yes, <laughs> yes, right? I think we is. sometimes we forget that we are below yeah, the Mason-Dixon Mason line. Yes, yes. right? Um, and so uh, Maryland likes to hold itself out as a progressive state, mm -hmm. uh, but in many ways it's not. In order to redress the issue of mass incarceration in Maryland, a holistic approach need to be taken according to Chandler and more resources need to be directed to the black community and support structures. There's a range of policies that we should be looking at, including things outside the justice system. We have to fund our education appropriately and not have a, you know, two different systems, mm -hmm. one, for example, in Montgomery County mm -hmm. and another one in Baltimore City. Yeah. Right? So yeah. We, we need to start leveling the playing field in that respect. That also goes for housing. That goes for employment, right? There's a range of issues mm -hmm. that, as we talked about, all sort of um, impact how people do and ultimately whether they end up coming into contact with the justice system. So we have to start looking at policies outside the justice system. Shasta Dean, formerly incarcerated in the Maryland correctional system, points out that the longer you keep a person incarcerated, the more it costs the state and, of course, the taxpayers. Because when you talk about age, you talk about uh, medical issues and medical concerns. Mm -hmm. So we already know what it kind of costs, you know, and I don't know if the numbers have changed, but, you know, s thousands of dollars a year just to house an individual. Then when you uh, add to the fact that they got medical issues, then it just increases, you know, and it becomes a burden on taxpayers. In fact, Maryland spends over $288 million annually on corrections in Baltimore alone. Instead of investing so much money in locking up people, Maryland should do a mass release of elderly prisoners because elderly prisoners cost more to incarcerate. Uh, in 2014, there was a mass release of elderly prisoners uh, under the Unger case uh, where almost 200 prisoners were released and there was one or two incidents in the entire release. Right, so one thing we know uh, when we talk about, for instance, the geriatric population of incarcerated uh, elderly folks who, who are in Maryland's prisons, you know, we've got uh, over a thousand people in Maryland's prisons sitting today who are over, the, over 60 years of age, who pose very little threat to public safety, right? the disproportionate number of those folks are black, mm, right? Yes. And the disproportionate number of them are black men who went to prison under the age of 25. And that's the other yes. um, uh, data point where mm. Maryland unfortunately leads the country, mm. right? 40% higher than other places, right? Wow. So we really have to have a conversation about what are we doing with those young black men now? Mm. And what are we doing with the older 
black men who are sitting in prison today who went there decades ago who no longer pose a risk to society why aren't we like with the ungers looking at how they can be safely returned to the community and we've already seen how individuals who've come home they have impacted and they have made differences in young people's lives so clearly that would be another benefit if more individuals who have reached a certain age, and you talk about that aging population, could come and they could, you know, bring value to the communities that they live in, to the neighborhoods, and even to the city, you know. I mean, we can go even broader than that, but, you know, again, we have examples. During the COVID-19 outbreak, Governor Hogan stated that prisons were the safest place to be. National statistics show that prisons are a hotbed for spreading the pandemic and the rate of deaths in the prison system is three times higher than that of the rate of the U.S. population. And yet, Governor Hogan put in an order simultaneously as he was saying overcrowded prisons were safe that would ban people from out in the larger community from gathering in groups any larger than 10. Because of public pressure, Governor Hogan agreed to release at least a thousand prisoners during the COVID-19 pandemic, yet he only released those that had misdemeanor charges and were eligible to be released within three or four months anyway. Thousands of elderly prisoners still remain locked up in the Maryland prison system as the coronavirus continues to spread.